This first Sunday of February, we are accustomed to celebrating Scouting Sunday, and I want to begin this week's message with a report from some of our scouts themselves. Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Zielman with Troop 894. Hi, I'm Wolfgang Vonderhard, the SPL of Troop 894. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Zielman, the SPL of Troop 894G. We wanted to give an update about how the troops are doing. Over the past year, we have had to improvise to keep the program going through these times. At first, we were having no meetings at all until the summer when we resumed meetings but had them outside. We ended up canceling summer camp as well as all the other camping trips for the rest of the year, making the troop meeting the one of the few times we were together doing activities as a troop. For the rest of the summer and into the fall, we had our meetings outside on the pad until we changed meeting locations because it was getting cold. We now meet at Turf One Landscape, where scouting is able to keep going. Although we haven't had many activities over the year, we are looking forward to the return of camping as the girls go to the Adirondacks at the end of March and the boys head over to the tree houses in April. We are also excited for the summer camping trips. We are headed to Florida Sea Base in June. Sea Base is a high adventure camp where the scouts will do several activities around the Florida Keys, from sailing and fishing to island camping and even scuba diving. It should be a great time and we cannot wait. We have even begun preparing by going to the YMCA pool monthly to assure we can pass the swim test. Other than the sea base, we are also looking forward to summer camp, as we are every year. But as mentioned, we canceled last year and are ready f for the week of camping fun. We are also excited for, for summer camp since we are going to, to camp at Lake of the Ozarks, which should offer different experiences and an amazing time. As we look forward to these events and activities, we are still scouting on our own time and have been throughout the past year, even with the challenges. The troops have gone to virtual merit badge classes, Lintec Merit Badge University, and have done merit badges independently. The girls also did the climbing merit badge, where they learned to rock climb and to repel off a cliff face. Other than merit badges, we have also had several rank ups and have had one scout make eagle. As you know, to achieve Eagle Scout is a great honor, and the troops are proud to have Joshua Zillman achieve such. Even though 2020 and this new year presented and still present challenges, we have overcome them and we are always prepared for the challenges ahead. We couldn't have been able to continue without the wonderful support from our charter organization and you, the congregation. From the bottom of all our hearts, thank you. Troop 94 is ready to continue with the support of the community and St. Martin's to provide a great scouting experience. Once again, thank you, and I hope you have a blessed day. Thank you, and I hope you have a blessed day. Thank you. We've been planning for a number of weeks now to record this particular message from right here on our favorite beach on the Gulf Coast in Florida. The, uh, have, the uh, horizon has been a little bit disappointing this week, but that's actually part of the message that we can't control the weather. Uh, we have to take what we get. The message today is about being fishers again, and all this month long we've been focusing on lessons by the seaside and by the seashore, and here we are literally by the seaside today. As I think about this lesson about becoming fishers of men, the first disciples, it occurs to me that what we really need to think about in our own day and time is a new kind of discipleship. The world is in need of a new kind of discipleship. In American history, there have been several great awakenings, they've been called, when a spiritual sort of a fervor has swept across the land in colonial America and then in the 1800s with preachers like Billy Sunday and, of course, Billy Graham, who brought a revivalism. In the 70s, uh, when the Living Bible came out, I remember uh, getting my first Living Bible in the common vernacular and, and just eating it up, reading it from cover to cover. It was called the Jesus Movement, along to a group of young people. Uh, a wide variety of ages. I was actually the youngest one at the time. That doesn't happen much anymore. And we traveled across the country in a bus. Uh, some of people will remember Bert Scherenhausen uh, as a part of the St. Martin's family, who was our bus driver. And we visited churches across the country. We were part of what was dubbed the Jesus Movement. I'm of the opinion that our culture needs another sort of a movement in these days, and we'll talk some more about that as we go on. This particular message, there is a sermon from American history by one of the preachers of the Great Awakening League, George, they named Charles Spurgeon. And Charles Spurgeon preached on this text about becoming disciples. I want to sort of outline Mr. Spurgeon's text 
and give it my own uh, imprint, of course, and make it more cogent for us today in our own time. So first, Spurgeon says about this text, about Jesus calling the first disciples, that they were called to follow him, of course. To follow him and to be made something else. He didn't call them because of who they were. He called them because of who they would be. And so it is the same with us as we follow Christ. It is not clear yet, clear yet what we will be. Christ will make of us a new creation. The Apostle Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, the old has been left behind. And behold, there is a new creation. Christ calls us to come and to follow him. We want to be shaped by him. The first disciples were cowered away in a room for fear after Christ was crucified. But then on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came, they had a holy sort of a boldness. And each one of them became a martyr for their faith because they were so bold and confident in their faith after the Spirit came, after they became what Christ would make of them. And so this first call for us to come and follow Christ and to become something else, to become a follower of Christ, to become more Christ-like. And this is our calling day for us to inspect our spirits and our souls and ask ourselves daily, are we walking in Christ's way? Are we becoming more like Christ in our life of faith, ever more growing by the power of His Spirit? Spurgeon notes in his message that it seems highly unlikely that plain peasant fisher folk, whom Jesus called, would become the founders of great churches and of great missions, that they would sail across the globe and spread Christ's word wherever they go to share the gift of salvation with others in a fashion that was bold and full of enthusiasm. But this is what the Spirit can do in the life of a faithful person. It's what the Spirit needs to do in my life and in yours. And so this is our calling. This is God's plan. That the fish should become the fishers. That those who have been caught in Christ's spell, if you will, of grace and love, would also be those who would spread the magic of God's grace and love to a waiting world. And so Spurgeon's call to us, and I think it's worth noting, is that if we have become faithful to Christ, that's only half of the call that Jesus gives us in this graphic parable about becoming fishers of men. Follow me. That's first. We're followers of Christ. And the next part is become a fisher of men. It means that our faith should be winsome that we should be man and woman catchers. The best way to do that, I think, in my own mind, is to make friends of others. And in that friendship, to show them what it means to be Christ-like in our own ways. In coming weeks, I'm going to share lessons from a new book by Bob Goff. You'll remember that he writes about love. Love Does was his first book about love in action. Bob Goff says he goes nowhere without a slingshot and a compass in his pocket. He uses a slingshot to shoot saltwater taffy at people to have fun, to share some sweetness. But also, he gives him the chance to tell the story of David and how he slew Goliath. And the compass, well, it's a way to point to the north of course. It's a way to show direction, to remind him of his own mission and direction. But also, the compass is a way to tell others about the true north in one's life, about the true point of guidance that we all need to see in the person of Christ. It's a sort of a friendly way to be an evangelist. In what way can you reach out to someone else to share your own faith, to have a conversation about what Jesus means to you and what he might mean to someone else? So the reason that I chose Charles Spurgeon's message was because his time in the late 1800s, about the time that our congregation at St. Martin's in Missouri was founded, as a matter of fact, for his time he felt like his generation needed a new calling of disciples, a fresh movement of the Spirit to spread God's Word. Don't you feel like our own time is similar? I'm kind of hoping that a post-pandemic America might come to terms with all of the issues that have been shown by this trial that we've had as a people, as a nation, as a culture. I think that the pandemic has been a test of our faith and has shown us to be selfish and truly individualistic. I'm praying that a post-pandemic culture might have a new great awakening, a new Jesus movement that will call us to compassion, that will help us to assess our individualism and to realize that 
the power to be left alone. It leaves us alone. That Christ calls us to one another, to grace and compassion. The object of our love has to be another person, by the way. And God created us for relationship with one another. We are blessed, but it is in order to be a blessing. It is an end in itself. God doesn't give us God gifts just to for me or just to keep for you. But a new movement of the Spirit will spread God's gifts, will celebrate God's gifts, and will use them to bring others to a new awareness of our place in God's creation. And so there were three things that Spurgeon said that he thought were important to note about this lesson. The first one was that the disciples were called away from their nets. They left their nets. They were called to go out from the comfortable place, out to a new place that God would show them, to follow Christ because he would lead them. And so that certainly is the motivation to be willing and able to leave our familiarity because we know that Christ is leading the way. But it is a call to be set apart. How, after all, Spurgeon said, can those who are of the world hope to ever save the world? Unless we protest against the world, we won't be able to call the world to change. The world is obsessed with power, and we're called to give all the power to God alone, and to Christ alone. He is to be our Lord and Savior, so that he might thus become the Lord and Savior of the whole world. The Apostle Paul said as much, and this is our calling, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever builds up one another, this is what we are to focus on in the new movement of the Spirit, in the new great awakening. Christ might just be calling us to in our day and age. For those of early American culture, the focus was upon holiness, a movement of holiness. Peter, in his epistles, the first and second books of Peter, after all, says, we are called to be holy because God is holy. And you think about yourself as a holy person. Well, the practical way that the early American Christians phrased it was that we should consider our holiness of heart and hand. How is our heart holy? How is it holy toward God, toward loving God and God alone? And how are our hands holy? How does our faith reflect itself in the good deeds that we do to others, in the loving deeds that we do to others? How do we use our hands to reflect the love that's in our heart? We are called to a new movement of holiness, I think, as we consider a new call to discipleship. The second thing that Spurgeon's message about Coming to Jesus again points out is that those first disciples who were called James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Andrew, uh, Philip, Bartholomew, those who were first called abode with Christ, they dwell with him. And so we're called also to abide with Christ. This means certainly to find Christ in scripture and in devotion and in time of prayer. But I have another suggestion. To abide with Christ, the scripture says in Matthew 25, the great judgment scene in the Bible, Jesus divides the sheep from the goats based upon what they did for the least of these, for the hungry, for the prisoner, for the thirsty. To abide with Christ is to abide with those whom Jesus went to when he was here, the sick who needed a doctor, and even the enemy who Christ calls us to love, the difficult person to get along with. To abide with Christ is to abide with one another. And then a third notion about the idea of being called to be fishers of men is that we are called to obedience. You know, the one thing that this pandemic should have taught us is we are not in control. It's a pretense that we have very little ability to control our environment. Instead, we react with faithfulness and we seek support from God. Obedience is not our favorite notion, but we are called to let Christ be the one who guides the way and who sets the agenda. To ask ourselves in every action that we do, if we are disciples of Christ, if we are to be fishers for men and women, to obey. We are called, if we are going to be fishers of men and women, to obey Christ, to do as Jesus did in the garden, to seek God in prayer and to say, Father, not my will, but your will be done, whatever it is. The pier in Navarre Beach, Florida, is one of the longest piers on the whole Gulf Coast, and there is always someone fishing, it seems, in any kind of weather. Let's uh, go uh, for this half of the message out onto the Navarre Pier and see if we can encounter 
some of the fishermen while I share with you this second half of today's message. Okay, let's take a long walk off of the long pier and see if anybody's fishing in the ocean today. The fishermen here are always very diligent. I'm sure there'll be somebody at the end of this long pier uh, fishing today. Let's go see. Jesus says, if you will follow me and if you will become fishers of men, as Spurgeon refers to it, you will follow distinct monitions. The word is M-O-N-I-T-I-O-N-S. has to do with emotions uh, that Spurgeon refers to. Monitions are the nudges of God, the urges of God to go in this way or that way. Let us seek a benediction, Spurgeon writes. And if we seek it, let us hear this directing voice that says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You men and women that sit before me, he says, are by the shore of a great sea of human life, swarming with souls of people. And you live in the midst of millions, but if you will follow Jesus and be faithful to him and true to him and do what he bids you to do, he will make you a winsome soul. Do not stay, do not say, who shall save this city? Do not say, who's going to work justice in the community around me? Do not say, someone ought to do something. Be the one who follows that urge. Consider the call of Christ that you are aware of something that needs to be spoken up about on behalf of God's will. Follow me, Jesus says. You are not fit for it by yourself, but I will make you fit. You can't do it by yourself, but he will make you do it. You don't know how to spread nets and draw shoals of fish to the shore, but he'll teach you. Only follow him, and he'll make you fishers for people. Spurgeon says in his message, and I think it's timely, I wish that somehow I could say this as a voice of thunder so that the whole church might hear it. I wish I could write it in the stars so that it would be up in the sky. Jesus says, follow me. If you forget the precept, the promise shall never be yours. If you follow some other track or imitate some other leader, if you listen to some other nudge or some other voice, you will be working in vain. God grant us to believe fully that Jesus can do great things in us if we will but follow. And so another aspect of this parable about becoming fishers for people, fishers of men, fishers of women, is that a fisher person is a dependent person, a person who needs to be trustful. A fisherman is one who cannot see what you're fishing for. One who fishes in the sea must go and cast his net, as it were, as a pre-adventure. Fishing is an act of faith, if you think about it this way. Spurgeon says, I've often seen in the Mediterranean men go with their boats and enclose acres of sea with vast nets, and yet when they've drawn the net to shore, they've had as much as just a little small result. I could put my hand in, and a few wretched silvery nothings would be what I would take out. Yet they have gone again and cast the great net several times a day, hopefully expecting something more to come of it. A fisherman is a dependent person, a person who must look up for successes every time he puts the net down, but still a trustful person, and therefore one who casts the net joyfully, always in great expectation. God make us a joyful people of expectation, a people of hope and faith. God make us fishers of men. Next, and I think most graphically so, fishermen are known for their perseverance. They're there at daybreak, and often they continue fishing until late in the afternoon. As long as hands can work, people will fish. May the Lord Jesus make us hardworking, persevering, unwearied fishers for the souls of men and women in our day and age. In the morning sow the seed, and in the evening withhold not your hand, for you know not whether it shall prosper, either this or that. Spurgeon says, the fisherman in his own craft is intelligent and watchful. It looks very easy, I dare say, to be a fisherman, but you would find that it was no child's play if you were to take a real part in it. There's an art to it. There's an art to mending the net just right and pulling it to shore just so. How diligent fishermen are to be able to persevere until the right catch comes along. And of course, if they get the good one, they always want to go back. Yes, Lord, and you will have us also to be fishermen who watch the corners of our nets, the net of the gospel, and that we might reach out to other people who need to hear the good news that it has to offer. 
may we be crafty as we as we mend our nets and as we use our craftiness and perseverance to endeavor to share salvation we'll have to always be at our business and the exercise will take all of our wits and more than that it will take the spirit leading us and guiding us god help us to persevere in the act of sharing the good news that has caught us in its net let me close with these words from spurgeon's message about becoming fishers of men now in the last place the person whom christ makes a fisher of men is successful well if any person in the world said to you i'm a fisherman but i haven't caught anything you would wonder how he could be called a fisherman a farmer who never grew any wheat or any other crop is he a farmer when jesus christ says follow me and i will make you fishers of men he means that you shall really catch men that you really shall save some with the good news of god's love come follow them with the consuming fire of god in your hand and fling it among the stubble and the stubble will glow be sure of that come follow them and scatter the good seed it may not all fall in fruitful places but some of it will you can be sure of that come and follow and let your light shine and some other eye will be lightened thereby in this work of faithful discipleship we must we shall succeed but remember that this is the lord's word and the lord's work follow me he says and i will make you something of you i will make you a man catcher and a woman catcher keep close to jesus and do as jesus did in his spirit and he will make of you and of me faithful disciples bold loving and persistent fishers of men